Hello, everybody. This is Learning to Look, uh, live art history lectures with me, Professor John Zeno. Really, I would call myself that, but I guess I have that title. You are. Um, <laughs> and we are brought to you by the Patrick Arts Council and the Pat Med Library. So uh, you keep those things in mind. Uh, we have a couple of things going on with the Patrick Guards Council. Um, this weekend, we'll be doing a reprieve, a reprise of our mocha lights. So there'll be some really stunning uh, light experiences on Main Street um, at the, at the um, which church is it in, Beth? Oh, it's the main, on Main Street, the uh, Congregational Church. The Congregational Church, right. Okay. Carnegie Library from 5 Carnegie. to 10 each evening, Thursday through Saturday. Right, so come on down and get some holiday cheer and look at some really um, incredible uh, art experiences and, and projected light. Um, also, if you have a chance, stop off at, at the Patrick Arts Council Gallery, MOCA Museum of Contemporary Art, Long Island, and see our show, New Visions. It runs through December 20th, so you have some time. It's open Thursday through Sunday, and uh, it really has some thought-provoking work in there right now, so go take a look at that. We'll be continuing learning to look in January. Uh, our topic will be the Neolithic. In February, we're going to uh, change paces and we're going to examine the history of Black American artists. And that's going to be in, in collaboration with our next show at, at MOCA, which is um, called Generations of Color. And it features six female African American artists, um, ranging from 25 to I don't want to tell you how old the oldest is, but <laughs> it, that covers at least g three generations of of, um, of women, and uh, they'll be sharing their art. And um, that will be a long, you know, that will be opening oh the same weekend as the inauguration. So it's a kind of an exciting time for that. So we'll also be doing a talk with many of the artists in the show in uh, February. I believe it's February 6th, but we have time on that, so don't write it in your book yet. Then in March, uh, we'll be opening uh, our next show, which is called Sidling. And I'm just going to tell you that Sidling has three artists, and Sidling is the motion that a crab makes as it moves sideways. And I'm going to leave it at that for now, but they'll also be doing a talk in um in March, we'll do another panel with them. And we're gonna look at the art of the ancient world following the Paleolithic and the Neolithic. So that's all that we have coming up. Um, oh, we do have the Beekeepers, which is going to be a, a pop-up show uh, for the weekend between February and March. Yeah, I still have my December calendar, so I, I can't look quite that far ahead, but uh, is a, a artist, Carice, who has uh, made portraits of Long Island beekeepers. So uh, it certainly is something to keep in mind and, uh, you know, uh, celebrating the people who are helping us keep our bees pollinating for us. And Beth, um, if you're still there, are we going to be doing the seed catalog? In, in, um, in... No, I haven't heard yet, but if we don't do it um, in January, which I don't think we'll be able to organize it in time, it'll just come later in the year at some point when we can find time for it. So we'll we'll do it next year. We're just not exactly sure when. Okay. Yeah, okay. I haven't heard back. Okay. So anyway, we won't talk about the seed <laughs> the seeds then right now. But uh, it's it all it's all in keeping bees and seeds and and the beginning of civilization and and uh, coming uh, of age. Uh, yes, of coming right. Who, you know, whoever thought coming of age, which is our theme for twenty twenty one, as we go from our twentieth year to our twenty first year, we come of age, and let's hope that it's a coming of age for our country as well too. Now, I have to um, give you a little bit of a of a. Uh, warning here. When I first started putting together the prehistoric talk, um, I had I had this ambitious blurb that I wrote that you might have read that talked about so much art that we were going to see. 
And then I started putting it together. And I said, I can't possibly do all of this in one talk. And so um, what I did was I divided it into two. And hopefully we can get the whole prehistoric uh, story of art in, in just two talks, right? So um, the, we begin the prehistoric with the Paleolithic period. And uh, there are some terms that I'm going to talk about. So um, uh, let me get started here. Okay. And we have to wake up the moving forward. Okay, so the term prehistoric simply means before writing, right? Before the uh, ability to record history, right? So it, it doesn't, it, it's a term of default, right? Um, uh, and that historic era begins around 3000 BCE in the Near East. And uh, another term that we often conflate with prehistoric is Stone Age. And the Stone Age has to do with the type of technology that is used, industry uh, and making tools that are made of stone, obviously. And it's, it's in many places in the world, the Stone Age gives way to the beginning of the Bronze Age, nearly at the same time as as the historic era begins, but it's not um, evenly uh, spread across the world equally, but that happens. So some areas developed writing when they were still Stone Age cultures, other areas uh, developed metallurgy before they became historic cultures. So um, we have, you know, there's some different play in those terms. But when we really think about prehistoric and Stone Age, and if you throw in cave people, which is really a misnomer altogether, um, uh, we're really talking about two periods in, in the development of culture, uh, human culture, the Paleolithic and the Neolithic. Paleo meaning old Stone Age, Neo meaning new Stone Age, right? And the thing that mostly separates the Paleolithic from the Neolithic is the development of agriculture. And of course, that happens at different times um, as well. And so uh, it's, it's always before uh, the beginning of writing and uh, metal, metallurgy, but um, actually not, that's not even the case because if you think about very Northern climates, um, they kind of had a harder time developing agriculture. So they might've developed other ways first, metalwork before agriculture in the North of places like uh, Scandinavia and such. Well, anyway, so today we're gonna talk about the Paleolithic, the old stage. This is the time of the hunter gatherers. And, we're gonna, and the Paleolithic really stretches way back, right? And it's divided into three periods the lower, middle, and upper. Obviously, I have them upside down here, but the lower is the first historic or the first chronological period, and the middle follows, and the upper is the most recent. And they're based on how, um, when archaeologists do digs, where they find material. So deeper in the ground, lower is older. And when we think of um, excavating, so the lower Paleolithic, Paleolithic is the earliest um, uh, periods of, of uh, human endeavor. And the, Paleo, the lower Paleolithic stretches pretty far back in time, some 3 million years. And that's when we start seeing the beginning of the use of prepared stone tools. Right? So um, they're simply uh, chipped away a little bit on the edges to give you a sharp edge. And we call these, you know, they were essentially uh, all hand axes. They would be used for various, um, uh, various uh, procedures from scraping to scraping hides to cutting meat and whatever else needed to be done. Uh, you, can, you can crack a, a stone and, get, and it would help you do that. Um, but when we go back this far in history, um, or in chronology, you can't say history, when we go back this far in chronology, we're not really seeing uh, the people who we are, right? The, they're actually 
a group of people who are, um, we use the term homo erectus to describe them. Some of the first of fully bipedal um, uh, members of the hominin species or hominin uh, class of people, of uh, creatures anyway. And um, the distribution, um, which follows in other subsequent waves is usually um, beginning in Africa and, and uh, migrating outward. So the culture uh, some, some almost 2 million years ago that made these um, stone tools began and spread around Africa and then migrated uh, to other parts of the, uh, the uh, uh, Western, Eastern Hemisphere. And, you know, um, there are some evidence that, that these uh, early humans um, actually had a sense of aesthetic. And uh, one of the few pieces that's available to try to promote this idea is this, um, this clamshell that seems to be inscribed with a geometric pattern on it. Now, this is only half a million years ago. So we've already had Oh, two and a half million years of very slow development in in, in uh, culture, and a, a couple of hundred thousand years later, um, uh, we're in the Middle Paleolithic period, and that's marked by the the use of more refined tools. They usually chipped on both sides and fashioned completely, um, and uh, during this time. We also see the um, the beginning of the use of fire. Now, the people who uh, the species of people are actually the same as us, starting about this period of time. They don't have as complex a culture, but they um, have pretty much the same genetic code that we do, going back about three hundred thousand years. So. Um, um, that that marks the middle Paleolithic period, and during the middle Paleolithic period, um, a couple of of cultures flourished. I have an extra zero on the bottom one. I'm sorry about that. But uh, about 150,000 years ago, different um, different cultures of of the human species. Um, uh, um, flourished, um, some in Africa, some in uh, Asia, some in, um, in Europe. The Neanderthals were in Europe, and uh, the Aterian culture was in North Africa. And you can see that the tools that they're making are much more um, refined than just hand axes. So they're able to make um, uh, uh, the tips of arrows and uh, and uh, all different kinds of blades are starting to be made here. Um, and e during that time, still in the middle Paleolithic, we start to see the actual um, the actual uh, sense of ritual starting, and uh, we see that in burials that have been uh, recovered, right, uh, excavated. People who clearly have been placed into a grave, and um, also in these graves, there is also found um, grains of pollen, which would have fallen out of flowers, which would have eventually decayed, and um, uh, which tells us that when these ritual burials were being created, um, that uh, oftentimes flowers were laid on top of the deceased uh, person. So uh, 100,000 years ago, um, which is a pretty long time, we're starting to see um, the, the beginning of real human uh, cultural behavior, human creative or artistic or aesthetic or religious behavior, any of those terms, right? So um, we are moving, we're creeping closer and closer to the development of the first works of art. So um, in this slide, I wanted to show you, you know, we saw how there was an earlier migration out of Africa. And um, again, around 100,000 years ago, there was another migration of what we consider the modern Homo sapien. And that came, out of Africa as well, too. 
And um, if you notice, all of the arrows begin somewhere in Africa and they move um, eventually across the entire globe. Now, there are two different uh, migrations that are happening or two different ways that we can, um, we can study the migrations that happen. One is the genetic material in people as they moved away. So, you know, when you, um, when you start thinking about indigenous populations in various parts of the world, you can compare their, their genetic um, makeup. And we find that if, if, you, if you include all of the continents except Africa, there is a very close relationship in the genetic sequence. There is more variation in the one continent of Africa. And uh, that's because when, um, when, when uh, this migration started from somewhere in the Serengeti Plains, um, one, three or four groups went into Africa and one group went into North Africa and had the ability to cross over into, into uh, the Near East. And from there, they were able to branch out and eventually cover the entire globe. It's an interesting, um, it's an interesting um, spread the way humanity eventually covered the globe. At the same time, there, there, we can trace language development and uh, all of the languages spoken from, from those, those, those same six continents, except Africa, are all more closely related than the languages. There's more diversity in language in Africa. So, so we, have, we, go back, we go back to Africa and see that the beginning, the roots of all culture is there. And one of those, root, one of those branches branched out and, and ended up covering the entire world. So, so the last places to actually get um, people were Patagonia, which is southern, southern um, South America, and Greenland. Greenland is an interesting story um, because the people who settled in Greenland were, you know, first they came from Mongolia and they traveled north to, to Siberia, and that's where you can see the sea on the bottom one. And then they crossed, the, they did this circumpolar navigation. Um, and um, the, as the Inuit people traveled very slowly, this is a very late migration, they didn't actually make it to Greenland until after, say, 1000 AD, or 1000 CE Common Era. So just like 1000 years ago, the first people made it to, uh, to Greenland. Now, in the other direction, you're, we've already had the Europeans and we're in the Middle Ages and, and of course the Scandinavians settled in Iceland uh, and then they moved off to Greenland and the, the, the Viking type people, the Norse people who reached Greenland were there only a few hundred years after the original Inuit uh, settlers to that area, right? So it was almost like uh, wrapping the world and coming together at, in the last spot being Greenland. So uh, it's kind of exciting to to follow the passage of human um, humanity through the world. But our talk today is more about art, right? And um, as we move closer to the uh, to the end of the Middle Paleolithic and towards the last stage of the Paleolithic the upper Paleolithic, we start to see more and more things happening that remind us of us, right? And um, so in South Africa, 70,000 years ago, uh, uh, people were making beaded necklaces and, you know, to adorn themselves with, right? So yeah, these shells have been drilled out and strung together. That, and this is kind of a thing that actually ended up uh, happening almost all over the world. Around the same time, 70,000 years ago, um, we, we have this piece of ochre from South Africa, and we definitely see the geometric incisions on it. So just like that clamshell from so far along the back, but now, it's, now um, there's no disputation that this is from 70,000 years ago. And it shows a beginning of an aesthetic wear, awareness Right, and um, we're we're timing out of the the, paleo, the middle Paleolithic, um, which kind of 
comes to an end, depending what, of where you are, between 50 and 30,000 years ago. So right on that cusp of, of moving from the middle to the upper Paleolithic, um, there are there are like a mingling of the Neanderthal, which were which were humans that had already been in Europe, with the more modern humans, and um, uh, they ended up interbreeding, and eventually the Neanderthal uh, lost its individual identity. But um, in one of the late uh, Neanderthal um, settlements, this object was found, and it's actually a bone that has been um, that has been uh, drilled out to make a to make a wind instrument, right? So this can be played. So we know that the uh, we know that the uh, Neanderthal people made music, right? So um, we ha we we no longer think of them as being as brutish as we used to. We think of them as being virtually contemporary in every way with with um, uh, other branches of the human uh, family. And um, in about this time when we reach the Upper Paleolithic, we are going to see the beginning of um, actual what we recognize as art. So there was music before there was visual art. Um, it kind of makes sense because um, music stirs us emotionally. Um, art does too, but, but um, music affects us in, in a part of the brain that, um, that is more connected to our our uh, lower lower parts where emotions sit. So anyway, around um, uh, 30, you know, around 37 BCE, 37,000 years ago, uh, 39,000 years ago, we see um, what was once thought to be the first, ex the oldest example of cave painting. And it's in Chavot Cave, cave in France. And there's a whole series of, of walls that have these various animals. Um, uh, most of these are lions in this particular one. And um, in another, we can see rhinoceros. Right? So painted throughout the Chavot cage, um, there are all these different groupings of animals. Now, this cave was recently found. Right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a recent find only in the last um, decade or so have become aware of this, and it originally put back the time um, over like 10,000 years as to when the first cave paintings were made. But then uh, something else was found all the way in Indonesia that was older, right? So now this uh, painting, which is significantly worn um, uh, from Indonesia, is given, given uh, uh, Pride of Place as being the oldest um, surviving or discovered uh, uh, cave painting. Now, it's important that um, we think about uh, caves as opposed to rock walls because the caves are pretty much uh, protected and um, uh, organic paints can, can survive on, you know, in places where they wouldn't out of doors, right? So um, 26,000 years ago, we see some the the cave paintings. Uh, this is actually on a rock wall in in Australia, and in Africa, twenty five thousand years ago, um, we can see some other evidence. You can see how worn these pieces get if they get weathered, and you know eventually they'll disappear. So uh, um, we are pretty lucky that we are able to find the caves that we do, and it has to do with the geology of the caves why we act, they've been preserved. So I'll get back, back back to that in a few minutes. So even in the Americas, um, uh, it's a vague date. We're not really sure where. It's, it's a very wide date for this one, but um, we do have painting going on in the Americas as well too, some of it stretching back over 20,000 years. And uh, not only in the, those those hard to reach places in America, but you can find even on the eastern side of our country uh, examples of um, rock paintings stretching back um, some 6,000 years. So um, the culture that painted uh, these, these, uh, these works 
was fairly similar around the world, right? Um, wherever you went, the people were uh, hunting and gathering, right? So it was a hunter-gatherer society. They tended to live in small bands and be uh, relatively nomadic. They didn't really stay in one spot and settle down. They went to where the herds were, right? And um, so that that essential culture was pan the pan the whole world pan the global right um and wherever you went in the world in this upper paleolithic period people were making the same kind of uh kind of existence and so um this takes us to la Chale, which was uh, first discovered in the 1940s and um, at first, people were, were hesitant to believe that these kind of uh, these kind of paintings were made as long ago as they actually were. They wanted to see them as hoaxes that were painted on the wall by modern people. But actually, um, after a while, um, the the uh, scientists were able to convince everybody that these paintings were dated almost uh, over 15,000 years ago. So La Chale is, is probably the most um, um, exciting cave. Um, it's one of the most well-known and studied caves. And um, this bull is the largest painting in on the cave. It's some 16 feet across. And um, uh, you can see that it's overlaying a horse and that there are other um, paintings of reindeer that are not too far away. Up above in the upper corner, there's a bison. And uh, all of these animals are painted individually without a sense of being, you know, part of a single composition, right? So they were painted at different times. And um, we'll get to why, why they were painted in, or the theories of why they were painted in just a moment, right? So um, you can see here um, what the actual space looks like that that these painting these paintings are made in. It's a it's a room right that that has essentially two sides to it. We're looking at one side, but if you look at the upper right, the 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 bull that you see pointing down is actually on the other side, and this is a trick of the of the lens. Uh, wide angle lens here but what's what's happening is, is that these 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 herds are wrapping around this entire room i want to point out one other thing if you notice there's a black kind of a darkened line right above the man's head and it crosses across the cave and if you notice like some of the horse's legs are uh, are no longer there and um you know, it made me believe. It made me think that at some point the water might have rose up to that level because of the way it feels uh, striated, the colors in the rock. And um, if the water had risen any higher, we might have lost these these creatures. But this was a sealed cave for fifteen thousand years. Nobody got in this cave, right? And because of that, these paintings were well preserved. And because the water level not get, never got any higher, uh, come the 1940s and the discovery of these uh, these um, paintings, people started visiting, and within 15 years, um, the paintings were just beginning to decay by the carbon dioxide exhaled by the people that were coming in there, and there was some new fungal growth that people brought in from their clothing into the, into these caves. Eventually, um, this cave was closed to the public, right? Um, in France now, there is a, a replica cage that you can, a uh, cave that you can visit that has, um, it, it's, it was created to be identical with the original. And the only way you can get into the original now is if you have like, you know, some specific research project that's that they're going to let you go into that space. So now this is none of us will ever see the original Lachau in person anymore. What's next? Sometimes it doesn't want to move. Okay, 
Well, this is an this this isn't a work of art, but it's it gives you a sense of what it takes to get to that cave, right? Uh, in the contemporary world, a spelunker could put on a helmet with a light, and he can squeeze his way through some passages, and and uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of climbing involved, a lot of crawling involved to get to these open spaces. You can see it's very far from from the opening. Actually, um, the the uh, paintings that that are in the cave of the bull, the cave of the bull, which that's called, is um, is a quarter of a mile of traveling through uh, this kind of uh, dark terrain. And um, we know that it was traveled. Uh, there, there's actually um, footprints that, that have been found along the way. And if you can see the people, that the, the, the people who are studying are all squatting down because the overhang is so low in this wall that people actually had to squat and oftentimes kneel down. So there are there are knee prints as well. So the people who actually had to go into these caves had a very difficult time. The artists who went in there chose very inaccessible places to make their works. And of course, once it was known, it was visited over and over again by by tradition and legend, so they knew where they were, but they were never easy to get. And they would make themselves some some um, shallow lamps out of out of stone, uh, and um, put some animal uh, fat in it, and put a wick, and th they would climb into climb through these caves to find their way to the um, to to the. Uh, to the depth of the of the paintings. Now I, I'm going to try to show you something here if it works. It's a um, it's a little video of of um, let's see if I can get to it. Here here it is. I'm going to open this up and let's see if we can see this. Here it comes. So this is a passage through the Lachau Cave. could see the paintings on the ceilings. It almost feels like you're going in an esophagus. So there's narrow passages with some painting, you know, with some painting on it, and then there are places where it opens up into wider spaces. This is like going to visit our gallery when you see the virtual tour of the show. We're going to come back and talk about this guy in a couple of, this painting in a couple of minutes. It's one of the 
only figures of a human painted in this entire uh, series of paintings. So let's see if we can get back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so anyway, you can see that you go a long way into those caves to find to find those uh, those special rooms, and uh, we now think that that um, the they were created um, for initiation purposes. So, oh no, gotta shut that off. <laughs> Hold on a second. Let me see if I can find that. Okay, gotta. Got to get rid of that. Sorry. Okay. Back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So what would happen is young people would be brought deep into these caves. Um, it, it, in their first experience there, they would be going through these very dark and scary places. And there would be adults waiting on the inside. And when the young people got there, they would light, they would, they would light their lamps and you would enter into this space and you would see this flickering light and all these animals on the walls and it was an imprinting experience like it was a rite of initiation into adulthood that's our current theory and uh, it imprinted onto the person you know the the experience was so powerful that it imprinted um uh onto the person and with that they were uh introduced into the culture of, you know, the responsibilities of adulthood. So that's the initiation, right? So um, a couple of other paintings, it's, um, some of the techniques that they used. Um, here you can see that this horse is actually, um, they used the contours of the rock for this horse. And this is in a cave in Spain. So sometimes they used the shape of the rock to help them uh, decide what creature was going to be painted there. And sometimes they didn't make animals. There are some uh, throughout these these caves. You can find handprints. The hands are usually created by um, blowing uh, paint through a straw, a uh, you know a reed straw, and putting your hand down and blowing over it. So the paints were usually ground and uh, made of um, organic materials and some 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 minerals like iron which gave you red and blacks. Uh, also in, in the Altamara uh, cave, some bison. And uh, this is what they look like on the ceiling over there. There's also um, small pieces of sculpture that come from back this way. And uh, a couple of animal figures. Just carved out of uh, ivory very realistic um, and these are actually made of clay and the clay was never fired so uh, eventually they cracked but um, you see that the legs might have might have dissolved in the rising water level at some point too but there's an incredible degree of realism in 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 the work of these um, paleolithic artists now um, Concerning the human figure, here is some of the oldest um, human figures, um, and they all tend to be small carvings made out of ivory from uh, different animal tusks. These are seen to be um, women. We'll look at a whole series of Venus figures now. Um, stretching way back, there's a little bit of a sense of realism. There's a sense of naturalism in the figure from Austria, right? Uh, and uh, uh, a sense of having like a face, you know, a unique face in this one from France. Um, the head has been broken off and it came from figures like, it was found around figures like we see on the bottom and an example of one where the figure was worn down but has the same um, essential shape to it from Siberia. So from France to Siberia and Spain probably we're seeing this culture of, of making of these female figurines, right? The, the preponderance of them are, have these similar proportions where there is a very large uh, abdomen 
abdomen and hip region and pendulous breasts, right? So um, we, we, we see a couple of uh, different versions of that. Again, these are all relatively small. They're handheld. And um, well, the one from Italy here is one of the biggest ones that was found. And you notice it doesn't even have a head. Don't know about the one from Slovenia, whether the head broke off or not, but definitely um, the one from Italy um, was not made with the head. The head um, isn't as important for the function of these pieces, which were all about fertility. And you can see even in the most famous one, the Venus of Willendorf, right? There's no face, like um, that um, the face is gone. This is, this is meant to stand for a generic woman. And um, she's got the pendulous breast and, and uh, the large hips. And obviously these things are emphasizing a woman's ability to, to bear and rear children, right? Which was something that was very important. You notice the hands are very, very narrow and they're just resting on the breast, almost as if they're showing off, like, you know, what the breast can do. There's minimal uh, detail in any other parts of the body, um, except for the head, which you can see is either got a, a extremely interesting braided hairstyle or a cap that was put on. Uh, we're not sure whether this is evidence of, of, of um, the actual baking of fabric yet, but we do have evidence of that this, this far back already. So this figure, the Venus of Willendorf, is really small. It's only about four inches tall. And um, when it was first discovered in a place called Willendorf, um, uh, it had traveled close to a thousand miles from where the original stone uh, was found, right? So th th this piece traveled a thousand miles through um, some trading routes in, an, in a culture that was so, so far into the distant past that we don't even see it as being us, but they were trading across long, you know, they had these long trading routes where they were able to send, you know, valuable stones and uh, back and forth through this through this whole territory that stretched from Siberia to Spain. So there's a lot of like, you know, there's much more, um, there's, there's a much more sophisticated culture in this period than we often uh, allow these people. This is a very interesting one, right? This one is much bigger. It's about uh, 24 inches tall and it's carved in relief. So it's not handheld, right? And it's carved onto a big stone, right? And the features of the woman are very much the same as the others we saw. But the uniqueness of this one is in the fact that the woman is holding a horn and the horn is notched, right? So um, the horn, um, has you know relationships to the bull of course but the crescent also has relationships to the to the moon right and we're thinking that all of these things uh, were forming forming you know connections in the in the minds of the people and so we had this crescent horn with the notches in it that is a reminder of the moon and it's held by a woman who is um who, who has uh, menstrual cycles that are tuned to the moon right so um we're seeing this awareness of of the relationship of the female figure to the to the to the to the greater world its ability to procreate is hooked into a cycle and all this awareness is there some 25,000 years ago right so um it's really fascinating really fascinating right uh some other carved figures um uh are kind of uh, uh, hybrid humans and animals. This is one. This is actually the oldest carved figure that that has been found forty thousand years ago. It's called the Lion Man, right? Uh, because it has the head of a lion and the body of a man. Right? He's very casual looking. It looks like he has his hands in his pockets. Right? Very very casual. But um, this idea of this hybrid being. 
uh, um, goes throughout the, the hunter-gatherer culture of the past, right? And here's one from much later, a painting. They, they, they call this the Sorcerer from a cave in France. And um, this time um, th there is, it's a deer who is standing in an upright position. Um, and this one, which I said we'd come back to, where there's a man with a horse's, with a bird's head, right? And he actually has a staff that has a bird in it. So we recognize this man's relationship to the bird. Now, this is a very complex scene, right? Um, there is a bison who you can see his uh, his uh, intestines are out. He's been he's been gorged by a, you know a spear, and he's in like his dying throes. But in that he is also gorging the man who is also now in his dying throes. Right, and this man is not just an ordinary man. He's what we call a shaman. Right, and uh, for a shaman to uh, achieve his place in the community, he has to have a death experience. And this has been um, related in more recent shamanism, uh, which we have studied primarily in the peoples of the of the Arctic. And we'll look at some of them there, there and things in a, in a moment. Uh, but the shaman has to go into the into this world of the death and then come back out of it. And that's what's being shown here. This man is now going to be able to live comfortably in two worlds, right? So when the people in our world have a need for the spiritual man, a world, this is the man who can intercede and go into that spirit realm, right? Um, uh, in another culture, uh, more recent, the Inuit culture, here is an example of a mask worn by a shaman. Now, this shaman is riding a uh, fish, and um, for him, he has to go be into the into the depths of the sea for the underworld, for the death experience. And this this man rides into the in into the ocean and comes back out, and so he's a man that could walk in, or exist in two worlds. Eskimo masks are really exciting things. Um, you know, uh, the, the imagination that goes into these masks are really incredible. If you notice, there's a lot of hanging and dangling things. The, the shaman would be dancing. And as he was dancing, there would be all this rattling going on from the masks and the, the remembrance of the different worlds that he traveled to. And he would actually, through his dances and his drumming, create a hypnotic effect and all the community would have a communal hypnosis. And that was when he was entering into the into the underworld. So that's, um, you know, the shamanism is, is a recent thing. Well, it, it still exists into the, into the recent times, but it stretches back, as you can see, at least up to 15,000 years ago, right? When, when we see, see those evidence and maybe even 40,000 years ago with the lion, uh, the lion man. So this is a cultural phenomenon that stretches way back in time. So um, this period of time that, that we're reaching is nearing the end of the Paleolithic. And depending on where you were, uh, where you were in the world, you would be either thought to be in a thing called the Mesolithic period, um, or the, um, it has a fancier name that I, it's on another slide. I'll have to get it for you. It's got, oh, it's the Epipaleolithic period, right? And this is like the, the, the last throes of the Paleolithic uh, art before it, um, before the advent of the Neolithic. And as I said before, in, in different cultures, it's, it, it, it's not a seamless transition from Paleolithic to Neolithic. But here's some of the works that were created at the very end of the Paleolithic period. Right? Um, there's this incredible wood carving that was found in Siberia, in that old uh, 
that old tundra really preserves things well. And there's a lot of rock painting uh, created during this period. And um, so this is a rock painting from Spain. Um, and uh, what we see when we look at th this work is, first off, there's a lot more people. The scale's smaller. There's usually a, a lot. Uh, it's usually groups of people who are within an active um, doing something. So, you know, they're dancing in this one, right? And this one is a really interesting one from Spain, right? F from 10,000 years ago, this is a beekeeper, right? This man is climbing a ladder and he's going to a uh, hive and he's going to collect honey. The bee are fly bees are flying around him, right? So it's kind of like, it's a very interesting thing to see happening 10,000 years ago, right? And we recognize now that we're really entering into a period of time that is, is, uh, is going to be very similar to the historic period. Some more, um, some more dancers. These are from uh, Algeria in the Sahara. The Sahara was not quite as um, barren as it, as now, um, and it was more like the grasslands of of um, Kansas and Nebraska. You know that kind of area. It wasn't as dry. Um, these these paintings were done there, and uh, a really incredible one from a little bit later. You can see that this woman is painted over some other figures. Um, this this running horned woman from only six thousand years ago. This is definitely the end of the the Paleolithic Mesolithic. Um, you know, uh, in various places they're, they've already moved into the Neolithic but not in this part of the world yet. So this figure is really amazing when you think about it, you know, um, it's so, um, so, um, so well crafted with detail and ornamentation. And we're seeing this woman wearing, you know, these horns. Remember the other woman holding the horn and the, ho and the bull and the horn are gonna play a bigger role in, in uh, later art as well too. And let's see, I think I have one more, oh, two more, right? From, from Palestine, a small sculpture, right? That uh, was created about, um, about 10,000 years ago of two people in an embrace, right? It's, it's very small, so it doesn't have room for a lot of detail. It looks very modern, doesn't it? It looks like modern art and, um, these pieces are what I'm going to close with from around the same time. We're seeing now uh, these are female figures that are highly abstracted, right? Um, no longer do you look at them and recognize the different parts of the body, right? But what we're seeing is um, the forms of the figure are being abstracted into something that is really no longer a figure, you know, or just has vestiges of the figure, the, uh, the one on the left, um, in ivory is, you know, you can see her buttocks and her breasts, and that's probably the most um, realistic one of the whole set, right? And this really beautiful one made of stone that would have been worn as a pendant. But um, we see these as being abstractions of the female figure. And it's that abstraction that I want to close with because um, as we move from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic period, um, uh, there's, there's going to have to be some new kind of thinking that is going to um, uh, let people do agriculture. Um, ab agriculture is a very abstract um, process. You have to plant food. You have to plant seed to have food months from now. And then you have to s not eat it all to preserve some of it so you can have food next year, right? And you have to be aware of the time, um, the, the cycle of the year. There's so much that goes into the, into the mind of a person who is developing agriculture. And that is where we're gonna, where we're gonna close with the Paleolithic and we're going to um, uh, pick up again in January with the Neolithic. 
Well, that's what I have for you today. And one of the rare occasions that I actually finished on time. <laughs> that's because I divided, decided to divide it in two. So you can only imagine how long it would have taken if I was um, going to do both the Paleolithic and the Neolithic in one time. Well, everybody, thank you for being here.